Hey, thanks for coming on out today. It's great to be back with you this morning. I can't tell you how excited I am to be back after a week away. Uh, if you were with us last week, obviously things didn't pan out quite as we were hoping for them to play out. Uh, not the most ideal uh, uh, way to uh, communicate, but it, it was what it was. But glad to be back here this morning. Uh, thanks for your prayers and uh, encouragement. I uh, wanted to just uh, highlight a couple things uh, this morning before we move into worship. Uh, number one, uh, it's Jerry's 80th birthday, and he just left. He just took off. So. <laughs> there he is. So he's going to leave now, but th happy birthday, Jerry. Happy 80th. Yep. Now you can go take your balloons. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Um, there's some cake left. I'm amazed at how much cake is gone. You got the first service. They must have gone to town on the cake because there was a lot there, and it's just you ate half of it. Jer Jeremy was really hungry when he came in today. Um, but uh, Jerry's 80th birthday, so that's worth uh, celebrating for sure. Um, we've got uh, a big comedy show coming up in about three weeks or so, the 23rd, and I just want to highlight that for you today. Um, you do need to get tickets to it. The tickets are free um, for now, um, and uh, you need to go to our website, which takes you to the link, and then with a discount code called Voyage Friends, it's all on there, uh, that will get you the tickets for free. We do need to have tickets because we have to control how many people come in here to this place. So uh, that's the 23rd. We've got some great comedians coming, uh, a comedian from Chicago, a comedian from Detroit, um, and then two or three other local comedians, and maybe a secret a uh, guest comedian as well. We'll see how that plays out. But uh, uh, that'll be coming up on the 23rd. It's a Wednesday night at 7 p.m. So looking forward to that, okay? All right, with that, uh, let's move into worship. Our team is ready. We've got an hour uh, of time together to worship, and uh, we've got a lot to fit in. So let's bow our heads in prayer and prepare our hearts for worship. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this hour in front of us where we get to come together and worship you, God. And I pray that you would set aside those distractions and let us come and share with one another and praise you ultimately, God. And we know by doing that, we will be blessed in return. And so, God, we bless you and you bless us. We look forward to that this morning as we sing these songs of praise to start out with. God, fill our hearts with your love, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you today, and it's good to be here. I was thinking this week about worship uh, and how it is different than it used to be about 30 years ago or so. Um, you know, we used the hymnals back then, uh, stand up, sit down, offerings, announcements, solos, whatever, kind of got fit all in between there. And it, it just um, sometimes... Uh, back then I felt like, you know, well, that's over with. Let's, what's the message and all of that, you know. But it's different now because this style of worship asks you to do something. It asks you to engage with God. And to notice each other, to do it collectively, is something that's a little bit different than what we used to do. And honestly, if you do that, if you truly engage with God and realize that, hey, when I'm speaking these words, other people are hearing it, and I'm hearing it, and God's hearing it, it just becomes more personal. And I think if we truly worship, it ought to change us. It ought to create a change within our hearts. We should not walk out that door the same person that we were when we came in because of our worship, because of allowing the Holy Spirit to work within our hearts through the whole thing. So um, let's think about that a little bit as we sing, that we're not just singing, we're engaging with God, and we're doing this together as a group. Um, that's only one time a week. We can't do that on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or whatever. Sunday morning, we can do that together. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry.
Voyage teens. Jeremy's going to take them down, and they will participate in communion downstairs. So make sure you grab your communion cups on your way down, guys. All right, uh, we're going to pray this morning and uh, catch up with one another, how we can pray for you, how we can praise God this morning. We'd love to do that uh, at this time. We'll pray for our missions, our military, those in need, uh, our friend Carol Leach. As All right, well, I did a little research this week, and I discovered that there's this place in Pakistan called Karachi, and it's a city in Pakistan. How many of you have heard of it before? I'm not very worldly, so I didn't know that particular part of the world very well. But back in the 90s, it was one of the most populated cities. Uh, it was a very populated city of like 9 million people that lived there. Um, the problem with this city, though, was that it was deemed one of the top five most unlivable cities in the world back then. And uh, people were getting sick. People were ill all the time. There was all sorts of diseases happening, illness, and that sort of thing. It was one of the most unlivable cities. Why was that? It turns out this place, this city, had 60% of its population living in the slums. And what does that mean to live in the slums? What would be some things that are happening if you live in the slums? You have no, what was it? Bad hygiene. Yeah, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, there was no electricity. There was no sewage system. And so you can imagine with those kind of things happening, no running water hygiene. Um, there, there was just a lot of, I mean, it was a perfect setup for lots of illnesses to occur. And because of that, they had great amounts of pneumonia and, and uh, diarrhea and other skin-borne diseases associated with that as well. So in comes this guy by the name of Stephen Lubby. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, but it's Lubby or Luby or something like that. He comes in with his team of researchers, and they're going to try to figure out what's going on here. And by doing that, they introduce a habit, and they're going to test out whether this habit makes a difference or not. Well, what habit do you think you would introduce as a researcher in a city like that, in the slums? What habit would it be? Hand washing and hygiene. You're on to something, Laura. Um, that's what they do. Um, they start to, you know, uh, introduce the idea of washing hands. It was something they observed for several weeks. They noticed people would just put their hands under the water just for a couple drops, that sort of thing. That was their idea of washing hands. Others would wash one hand but not the other. And then other people, before prepping food for the family, uh, they wouldn't wash their hands. And so they noticed this sort of thing happening. And yet at the end of the day, these people, when researched, when asked, they knew, they knew how important it was to wash your hands. They knew that, right? It wasn't a knowledge issue. It was a what? Consistency habit issue. It wasn't a habit in their everyday lives. The same could be said, I think, for these habits that we've been talking about in the series. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, we've been talking about these habits of grace, uh, habits like scripture reading, um, habits like study of scripture, habits like last week, which was prayer. These are things that we know we're supposed, like, you know, since we have been Christ followers, we probably were taught pretty early on that we should read scripture. Like, I know this in my head, but yet it's not a consistent habit, right? So we know that. Uh, habits like Bible study. Like we know we should probably study the Bible more so than just reading it. We should study it deeper in certain places in certain ways. But yet it's not a consistent sort of thing that we put into our lives. And then last week, of course, prayer. We know how important prayer is. I believe in prayer. I believe in the power of prayer. That's why we dedicate part of our service to prayer. We believe it makes a difference, and yet it's not a consistent sort of thing in our lives. Now that one verse, which has kind of been foundational for us, I want to just take you to one more time. This morning, 1 Timothy 4, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly, Paul says to Timothy. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. So yes, you might train for a race. You might train, you might go to the gym because you're trying to get healthy. You might uh, walk 10,000 steps because you're trying to stay active. But the kind of training that Paul is most concerned about and wants to impress upon his brother in Christ, Timothy, is the training that takes place for godliness purposes, right? So each of these habits trains us 
for godliness. We are trained for godliness as we read Scripture. We are trained for godliness as we study it. We are trained for godliness as we pray like Jesus once prayed. We saw last week that Jesus routinely goes off to pray. It's just part of his everyday habit, his everyday life. And if we're trying to become more like Christ, these habits of grace put us in a position where we can become more like Christ. So we do the kind of things that Jesus did, these habits of grace. But just like uh, these other habits, the habit this morning that I want to talk to you about this morning, and it's a habit that might be the most foundational, most important habit of all, is one of those that it's easy for us to forsake, and it's easy for us to forget about. But it's so important, and it's something we take for granted, because here we are this morning. But the habit I'm talking about today is the habit of worship. Worship can be a habit, should be a habit. Sometimes we think of it as just something we do on Sunday mornings, occasionally or every Sunday or whatever your pattern of worship is, but it is a habit of grace whereby we can be changed. We're going to talk about that here in the next few minutes. Before we do that, though, let me just define uh, worship a bit. And I want to define it by showing you what worship actually looks like first. So if you have a Bible, I want to just open up to Isaiah 6 for just a moment. Isaiah 6 in your Old Testament, here's a picture of worship. Here's what worship looks like. Isaiah shares these words in Isaiah 6, verse 1. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. So there's something like an image of what worship looks like. These angels worshiping God in the heavenly courts, right? And Isaiah getting some, something like an observer's sort of view of what that would look like. Beyond that observation, though, let's try to define it. And Dallas Willard offers us a simple definition of worship. To worship, he says, is to see God as worthy, to ascribe great worth to him. We are here this morning because God is worthy of our time, right? God is worthy of our worth of worship. We are here today because of that. Willard goes on to say that when God is present amongst us as he is in worship, he shows off his beauty, he shows off his goodness, he shows us his greatness. We see this happening all the time as we worship together. We see this in the story in Isaiah 6 as well. But even better, I think, is the definition that Richard Foster offers us. He says this, to worship is to know and experience and feel the resurrected Christ in the midst of a gathered community. I like that because it has to do with Christ, right? To, to, to know and experience and feel the resurrected Christ in the midst of a gathered community. There's something here that happens when we gather together, and sometimes we have to gather virtually. I get that because of a pandemic or illness and that sort of thing. But even better is when we gather together in person, locally, like this, there is something that happens that doesn't happen otherwise. So we gather together in worship because it's very important. Since the dawn of Christian history, worshipers have been gathering together, even in dangerous times, even when it could get them killed for their Christian faith, they've been gathering together. And so the writer of Hebrews says it like this. He says, you know what? Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us think of these sort of ways. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now, that the day of his return is drawing near. The writer of Hebrews is saying to you and I, it's so much better if we can gather together. So don't set that aside. Don't discount the importance of coming together locally, if we can, to worship with each other. Now, this leads to a um, problem. This leads to a, 
um, a problem identified. Uh, it's a false narrative, as James Bryan Smith refers to it in one of his books. He says, the false narrative that some people have bought into is that they can forsake worship because they believe they can worship God just fine by themselves. How many of you have believed that or know someone, friend or family, that believes that? Like, I've visited people who are shut-ins, not because they're physically shut in, but because they don't feel they need to come to a place like this, either virtually or in person, to worship God. They feel like they can worship God by themselves. They've got everything at home they need to worship God. How many of you have heard or know people like that? There's plenty of people out there that believe that very thing. We have been coming together for years to share with one another, to hear from one another, to share our stories, to worship one another as we have done this morning so far. And when we come together, again, friends, there's just something that happens that you don't get by worshiping God by yourself. Yes, there are seasons, there are times when we have to worship by ourselves. I get that. Uh, there are moments throughout the week where we can worship by ourselves in private, but the writer of Hebrews is correct. The better option, the better option, friends, is to come together as much as we can and worship with one another. There's a synergy, there's an energy, we'll talk about that here in just a moment. I like what Martin Luther said. He said this, he says, at home, in my house, there is no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude has gathered together, there is a fire kindled in my heart, and it breaks its way through. There is a fire that's kindled in my heart, and it breaks its way through. I love that description of what it means to come together and worship. So we come together as much as we can to worship with one another. Now, returning back to that story we began with this morning, and the team of researchers led by Stephen Lubby, what they did is they partnered with a soap company, Procter & Gamble, and they gave all the people in this town, this area in the slums, some soap. And here's the soap that they gave them, Safeguard Soap. How many of you use Safeguard Soap aside from Jody? Jody? Dan? Anybody up? Okay. Well, how does it smell? Jody, how does it smell? <laughs> so the thing about, I've never used Safeguard soap, so I can't speak to this from experience. I was trying to find some. I couldn't find any at Meyer. But anyway, um, what they found is that the people in this, uh, this, this slums um, in Karachi, uh, when they got the soap, they were given the soap, when they got this soap, uh, they loved it. Like, they loved two things about it. Number one, they loved the smell of it. Like, it smelled really, really good. And number two, it foamed up a lot when they washed their hands. They loved washing their hands in that sort of way. Um, so what they noticed after a few months was that illnesses seriously declined. Like, by 52%, diarrhea was down. Um, uh, pneumonia was down by like 38%, and other skin-borne diseases were way down by like 30-some percent as well. Just after a few months of instilling this habit, using Safeguard soap. And what they found was the reason why these people kept at it, because it smelled so good, it felt so good, it was simply satisfying to them, right? Satisfying to them, that's why they kept using Safeguard Soap, and uh, they returned six years later uh, to this area uh, after researching it. After they stopped giving out the soap, they were no longer providing them with soap. They returned six years later to find that 95% of those households that were given the soap initially were still using soap. They had water stations set up, hand washing stations set up to wash their hands, and the effects were just amazing. Uh, simply by instilling a simple habit. Because what happens when something is satisfying to us, like it smells good? What do we want to do? We want to do it again and again and again. And that's exactly what happens with this habit. Likewise, when it comes to our habits that we've been talking about in the series, the more we can make it satisfying to us, the better chances we have of following it. Uh, in the book I've been kind of highlighting that I kind of just stumbled upon called Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's not a Christian book, 
But in this book, which is one of the simplest books I've ever read about habits, he really does do a good job of just kind of outlining some things. And he says, you know what, if you want to start a new habit, you better make that habit easy. Hence the two-minute prayers of last week, okay? Uh, hence 10 minutes of Bible study. Make it easy, right? Um, but aside from that, one of the other principles he suggests is to make it satisfying, right? To make it satisfying. When you make Scripture reading satisfying, and whatever that is for you. For me, again, I shared a couple weeks ago, it's checking the box off my habit tracker, right? So maybe you come up with a way to track your habits, and when you check that box, boy, is it so much more satisfying than if I just did it, right? So whatever it is, the more we can make it satisfying, the better chances we have of instilling that habit in our lives. And so this morning, I asked myself the question as I was preparing for this, how can we make worship more satisfying. And I think it has to do, let me just back up for a minute. Um, sometimes we churches get it wrong and think that it's about creating a place where people are entertained, okay? Um, our job is not to entertain the church. Our job is to train the church, okay? That's what we are here for. We are training in godliness. That's what we should be about, okay? And so one of the things that I think we understand when it comes to worship that's satisfying about it is to understand what happens when we worship. So I want to just briefly share three quick things that we get out of worship that happens to us when we worship that provides a measure of satisfaction to us. And the first one was uh, this word, an awakening. There's something that happens to us in worship that we can simply call an awakening. Now, I see people walking through the doors on Sunday mornings, and I can see some of you are in a cloud. Some of you are in a slumber. Some of you are in a fog. Uh, I've been there myself. I'd like to tell you that every Sunday I've got it all together, right? You think I have it all together every Sunday? Uh-uh. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, but I see it. Like, we come in to worship sometimes with baggage, with a messed up, difficult, tough week, whatever it is. And yes, we pastors have tough weeks too. And so we come in and we need to worship. And what happens when we worship is there is something like an awakening that happens. To show you this, look at Psalm 73 with me for just a moment. Psalm 73 is a great psalm that shows us what an awakening looks like. So this psalmist in Psalm 73, is a bit upset with God. He's calling out God because he sees the wicked people around the world prospering, right? While he himself is struggling, right? He's this righteous guy. He's writing a psalm of all things. He's not happy with God because all these proud, arrogant people are succeeding while he himself is struggling. So he calls God out on this. Uh, and then he says these words in Psalm 73, verse 13. He says, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. Okay, so that sounds like a fog, right? But then he starts to come out of the fog. Look at verse 17. So I or verse 16. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper. But that's a really difficult task. Verse 17, then I went into your sanctuary, O God. Then I went to church, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. So now the psalmist gets it. He comes to church. There's an awakening. My health may fail, he says in verse 26, and my spirit may grow weak. But God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. And then he ends, But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. When we come together to worship, there is this awakening. And I can think of very few things that are more satisfying to me than to experience that awakening on a Sunday morning. When I'm in a fog, to leave here far more clear, awakened, my soul, a soul that's awakened, a soul that is experiencing that fire that Luther talked about. What a joy that is. A second thing that I think happens when we worship is there is definitely a measure of growth. Uh, and that's one of the things I think we forsake when we don't gather together like we should, is we stop growing. 
And there's a veil that comes over our lives, and the longer we stay away from worship together, there is this veil that gets more, uh, I guess you could say, thicker and thicker and thicker. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says some things about this veil. I want to just take you to for just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, whenever someone comes back to church, for example, turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. To be more like Christ, to be changed, is to grow. That's what happens when we gather together for worship. There is a growth that happens. It's a means of grace whereby we are transformed from the inside out to be more like Christ. That happens when we worship. And sometimes we forget that. I forget that. I forget that. There's one more thing I think that happens that's very satisfying. And that is a joy that comes over us when we worship together. The songs that we sing remind us of how great God is, and there's just a joy inerrant in those songs of worship that we sing together. Uh, someone you once said uh, that, I guess it's a Swedish proverb, I think is what it was, that a shared do- joy, a shared joy, joy that we share together in worship is a double joy. In other words, our sh- joy is so much more awakened and heightened because we've gathered together. If it was by ourselves, yes, there would be joy, but our sh- joy is somehow doubled. It's not maybe scriptural, but I think it's in scripture that our joy is awakened. Our joy is heightened as we gather together to worship. So we come together and experience great joy as we worship. We come together and our soul is experiencing growth, and we come together, and we're also experiencing that awakening. These are all things that happen to us that satisfy our souls when we gather together. So make no mistake about it. When we worship God, there is a um, there is an aroma that is pleasing to God when we worship Him. When God hears us singing to Him, when God hears us praying to Him, reading Scripture, there is blessing. To God. There is a pleasing aroma to Him. But it's not just about Him. There are some benefits to you and I as well, right? There is blessing and favor upon us too. That's why worshiping together is so very important. In the end, we'll just leave it like this worship matters. It matters to God but it matters to each and every one of us as well. And so we gather together as much as we can. We do not forsake the assembly as some are prone to do, but we gather together to worship this great, awesome God. Worship matters. Let's practice that more and more. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this reminder. Something we take for granted. Yeah, we might come to worship each Sunday, but do we really see it in the proper sort of way? Have we really prepared in the proper sort of way to be blessed, to bless you, God, but also to be blessed, to experience satisfaction, to experience this awakening and this growth and this joy? God, would you double our joy when we come and gather together with one another in worship? Double our joy each time. Help us to worship you at home, But more importantly, God, as we gather together, help us to worship you in this place all the more. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And one of the beauties of worshiping together is... Just in case you're wondering, um, the other sacrament is baptism. Some of you would wonder about that. I'm telling you. Um, Yes, we are going to participate together in communion or the lord's supper and does everyone have one of these anybody need one i think we got everybody great these are tricky things let me tell you how they work first we do these because of covid um there's a little tab on there and if you'll notice that the um 
there's two pieces. One is a real thin cellophane, and if you take that off, you'll find the wafer, a small little wafer, and then if you take the other part up, you will find the liquid, and the liquid in here is not alcoholic. So Jesus invites us to his table this morning. We've been invited. We've been invited to be fed, to be nourished, and to be loved by him. In Matthew 11, verse 24, Jesus says, Come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We sang that song, the first song we sang, Come, all you weary and heavy laden. So we're going to use the words of that song sort of as a template this morning to our time together. Jesus invites us to come as we are. We don't need to clean ourselves up. We don't need to put any mask on. Jesus asks us to come as we are, weary, heavy laden. He says, come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that I give that never runs dry. Come and drink of the water, come and thirst no more. He says, come, all of you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to his table, for he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, and here you will find what you're looking for. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, Come, lay them down at the foot of the cross because Jesus is waiting there and he has his arms wide open to receive. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for inviting us. We come to you, to your open arms, to your table, we come as you asked us to do with all of our stuff, fully aware of our sins, things we have done and things we haven't done. We come with our attitudes of judgment, our prejudices toward other people, and our judgment toward ourselves. And we lay it all before you, Jesus. The raw, ugly, smelly, putrid stuff that clings to us. We give it all to you. And we say, I'm sorry. Yes, I did it. Yes, I thought it. I need your forgiveness. I need your cleansing. I lay it all at the foot of your cross. And in the Bible, in 1 John 3, verse 19, we read the promise. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. And he will forgive us our sins, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Well, we have confessed, and God has forgiven and cleansed us. So as forgiven, cleansed followers of Jesus, we receive the bread and wine that he gives us. Lift the cellophane and find the wafer. And on the night when Jesus was with his disciples, and now 
as he's with his disciples, us, here, we hear him say, this is my body, which has been given for you. Do this and remember me. And then Jesus took the cup and we lift the tab and Jesus said, this is my blood given for a complete remission of all of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for inviting us. Thank you for forgiving and cleansing us. Thank you for feeding and nourishing us. Thank you for quenching our thirst. And oh, Jesus, thank you for being what we're looking for. Thank you for the freedom you won for us. And oh, Jesus, thank you for defeating the power of death and giving us eternal life with you. We praise you, God, for the wonder of your love for us and for all the people of the world. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be set free so is God's forgiven cleansed healed people let's go out into this week with him amen <laughs>